God will make all things new that day. Lord, is the curse from which I stumble and Never crying again and praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of the risen the nations bow down to see the only sign. Ready? Good morning. Welcome to South Ashford Church of God. Good to see each of you here. Thankful for those watching online. It's good for us to be in this place together today. I think about all the, t all the places we've been this week. Yes. It is a blessing to be in God's house. Amen. Yes. Let's all stand together. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. For, ask for his help on this part of the service, the Sunday school, and of course leading us into other parts of the service. We need his help and his touch today. Amen. Let's go to him together in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for goodness, Lord, your grace, your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your help and your touch, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, that you've led us here together today, Lord Jesus, to lift up your name, to magnify you, Lord. Lord, there's none like you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. We ask for your help, your touch, your blessing, Lord, on this service today, God. We can't do it without you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we're here because of you, Lord. We lift up your name. Oh, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Touch and meet every need, Lord, and every few, Lord, those watching online. Lord, we thank you for your power, Lord Jesus. Oh, save, sanctify, fill with the Holy Ghost today, God. Help us to grow in grace, the knowledge of you, Lord. Touch our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, Lord. Oh, Lord, that we magnify you, Lord. Exalt your name together, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Your perfect will be accomplished in us, Lord, in each and every life, Lord. Oh, we're grateful, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Ask our ushers to come and receive our Penny March. Our Penny March, of, co of course, is for the Church of God Children's Home. This is change if you have anything you want to give for that. And then they'll come back through and receive our Sunday school offering following that. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will
teachers, you can take charge of your classes this morning. Those of you remaining in the adult class, we are on our new quarterly. If you don't have a quarterly, that's perfectly fine. You can turn with us to the book of Acts, chapter 10. It's good to see each of your faces. Good to see our visitors this morning. We're blessed and thankful for you being here. Amen. Thankful for those watching online. Pray for those that are, aren't able to be here, those that are sick and uh, going through battles and trials today. We just lift them up too. You're missed when you're not here. Amen. All right, we begin our, our new quarterly um, lesson one. It's titled Pentecost is for everyone. Uh, we're going to go through some of what takes place here in Acts chapter 10. Um, our golden text um, is found in Romans chapter 3, verse 29. It's listed in your quarterly, but I'm going to read it to you. Golden text is, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Question mark. Yes, of the Gentiles also. I'd like to read it again. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And i got to read it one more time. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Amen? Our introduction says, Acts 10 marks an important transition in, this, in the spreading of the gospel. Although Jesus had told the apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel, which is found in Mark, in Mark 16 and 15, it seemed they were slow to be fully obedient to this command. During the persecution after Stephen's death, many disciples were scattered and preached the gospel to the Jews only. Philip preached to the Samaritans and also to an Ethiopian eunuch who may have been a Jew or a proselyte Jew. All of these people were keepers of the ceremonial law. While Cornelius was a good man, he had not become a proselyte of, of Israel. That's who our lesson is on today is Cornelius. In this miraculous meeting between Peter and the centurion, we see that God's gift of full salvation through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost are freely given to both Jew and Gentile. We want to read together today our scripture text. Uh, we are It's found in your quarterly, but if you're not, don't have one again, if you look in Acts 10, we're going to read verse 34, and then we're going to jump down and read verses 38 through 47. All right, Acts 10 and 34 says, Then Peter opened his mouth, and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now we're going to jump down to verse 38. How God anointed Jesus, this is Peter preaching, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Again, this is Peter preaching. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it was he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as, as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Just want to clarify right from the start a couple of terms that are probably already known about, but on the chance they are not, I want to make them clear. Who is a Jew? I looked up a definition, and of course, I added some things to it. This is what um, I came up with. A Jew is a member of the people and cultural community whose traditional religion is Judaism and who trace their origins through the ancient Hebrew people of Israel to Abraham. In short, they are the descendants, even today in the land of Israel, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, of course, we know his name was changed to Israel, and now Israel still exists today. 
Just as a side note, where did they get the term Jew? Where did the word Jew come from? It is derived from the son of Jacob, who was blessed with the ancestral line of Jesus Christ, the one blessed to carry on the family name, and that was Judah. So the word Jew comes from the name Judah, and it is associated with all who descended from Israel, the man Israel, Jacob. From the Jewish line of people, God sent his son, Jesus, into the world. Amen? Amen. So, who is a Gentile? The short answer on this one, it is anyone who is not a Jew. That means me and you. Most of us, I don't know if any of us have any Jewish descent, but most of us here in this place, we are Gentiles, considered Gentiles. Now, we must remember the strict adherence by the Jews to the Jewish laws and rituals that were given by God and then practiced in the Old Testament. Laws of sacrifice and observing feasts and festivals and the law of circumcision and the covenant God made with their forefathers, these were exclusive to the Jews. But as we come to the New Testament, as we come to Jesus, all of this is about to change. And that change takes place inside one house with the very first Gentile conversion. Acts 10 is that story. Now the scriptures we have already read are only a portion of what took place that day. So let me give you a little backstory. Let's talk about Acts 10 a little bit more in depth before we get to these verses that we've already read. Cornelius, he was a centurion. Now I'll tell you what a centurion is. He was an officer of the Roman army and he was in command of a hundred soldiers. Um, several places in scripture mention centurions. Matthew 8 and 5 tells of a centurion who lived in Capernaum who approached Jesus on behalf of his ailing servant. Mark 15 and 39, a centurion witnessed the crucifixion, who witnessed the crucifixion identified Jesus as the Son of God. In Acts 27 and 13, a centurion by the name of Julius treated the apostle Paul with courtesy. All of these passages illustrate a generally favorable impression made by the centurions who appear in the New Testament. Cornelius is no exception. Cornelius and centurions were career soldiers who formed the real backbone of the Roman military force. Now Acts 10, Acts 10 opens with Cornelius not only as a Gentile, but he's a career soldier who was a captain in charge of a hundred soldiers but verse 2 says he was a devout man, if you look at it in your Bibles. He says he was a devout man who feared God with all his house, and he gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Now, the Amplified says of that he prayed continually to God. Now, we can see two things here at this point in Cornelius' life and his story. The first is the fact that he was a good man. He was giving. He prayed. He did what he understood to do in order to follow Christ. But Cornelius is not saved yet. He hasn't met Jesus personally around an altar. Being a good man or a good woman does not make you saved. Amen? Praying prayers to God and giving money to the church or to the needy, doing good deed for, deeds for God's church and for the community are nice things. But Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus excuse me, in John chapter 3, Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Going on down in that same chapter, verses 5 through 7, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. There are countless Corneliuses on church pews today. People who hear about God, who maybe even um, get emotional about him and really believe he is God, but they have not been born again. People who are deceived in other religions, perhaps, who only, that, that only skim the surface of who God, who Christ really is, People who love to do good things for people and for their communities and have a basic knowledge of who God is, but they have not had a, had a life-changing, soul-changing, heart-changing experience with Jesus Christ. Amen? I used to live that way. 
and I can testify to the fact that it is exhausting and it has no roots. Therefore, it is fleeting and easily swayed. It is shallow and unfortunately all in vain. Go to church all your life. Serve the community. Serve your church. Be a part of things. Be helpful and still not be born again. It's all in vain. Cornelius was a good man with good intentions and good values, but that was all about to change because God began to call on him. God the Father reached out to Cornelius, and he did so by way of a vision recorded earlier in chapter 10. We don't have time to read all of that. Hopefully you did if you had looked at your quarterly this week. This vision involved an angel speaking to him, speaking to Cornelius, and giving him instructions to send men to a place called Joppa and to find and bring back a man by the name of Peter. We know him well. He, to he told Cornelius where to find him and that he, Peter, would tell him what to do. So an angel appears to Cornelius, tells him to send men to Joppa, collect this man called Peter, and Peter's going to come back to you and tell you what to do. So Cornelius imme immediately responds to what God, God shows him to do, and he talks with three men and sends them to Joppa to find Peter. Now in the meantime, over in Joppa, God is working on Peter as well with another vision entirely. And we're going to read this vision. It's in verses 9 through 16 of Acts 10. Not in your quarterly, but of course in your Bibles. Let's read this quickly. Thought it was important. Okay. <clears throat> 9 through 16. And he became very hungry. Now, this is Peter, and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending into him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. There came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. God established a group of laws specifically for the Israelites concerning clean and unclean animals. Leviticus chapters 11 and 22 and also Deuteronomy 14 give the specifics of these regulations. These regulations were still practiced during this time that Peter was shown this vision here in Acts 10. He was studying on the meaning behind it, the meaning behind this, why did I have this vision, what is going on here, even as the three men arrived who were sent by Cornelius. So here we have Peter having a vision about the sheet and the animals and what God has spoken to him, and we have Cornelius who's had an experience where he is, and now they're about to be connected. Aren't you glad that God works on both ends of an equation? God instructed Cornelius on one end, and he instructed Peter on the other, and he brought them together. When God is up to something, he touches all hearts involved. Um, he leaves nothing out. I can remember Grandpa Shelton, Shelton saying something about this when he talked about a man, maybe a man coming to him and saying, God told me this, that this is what we're going to do or whatever, and and he was quick to say, well, if that's what we're going to do, God's going to show me too. And that's the truth. God works on both ends when something's going on like that. When God speaks and directs, we must, be, we must move and obey. Both Peter and Cornelius, if you read it closely, had to step out on faith and follow where God was leading them. You know, they had conversations. Of Peter literally he went into a trance and saw these things of, of the Spirit. And Cornelius had an, an an actual full-on conversation with an angel. But they still had to go out and do what they were instructed to do. We must move and obey. Both Peter and Cornelius had to step out on faith and follow where God was leading them. It was a sort of stepping out of the boat again for Peter. Neither of them knew the big picture of what God was up to, but they followed in the place they were called to, and God was going to reward them both in a mighty way. Let's read verses 17 through 23. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius 
had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherein you are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, is a great man, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Peter's message to the Gentiles was the same message. Let me, oh, let me, I forgot. Let me read you something from the quarterly, I'm sorry. Jumping ahead of myself. We've, we've already read, the verses that we read when we started were the, was the actual um, message that Peter preached once he got to Cornelius' house, okay? We read that at the very beginning when he's talking to, uh, to, the, to the Gentile people. So here is what uh, the, the commentary, or the, excuse me, the quarterly says. As the preaching lifted up Jesus, this is talking about Peter preaching to them once he gets to their house, the power of God flooded all the hearts of the hearers of the word John said that when Jesus would be glorified, then the Father would give the Spirit. His Father had exalted him and had given the Holy Ghost. Jesus said in John 16 and 14 that the Spirit would glorify him. This was a fit place for the Holy Ghost to fall and a message magnifying the person and work of Christ. We look back at, at Peter's message. He's lifting up Jesus. He's telling them all the things that had happened, that they had witnessed themselves, and this is where the Holy Ghost came. Jesus also called the Holy Ghost the Spirit of Truth. Notice the ones that he fell on, them which heard the word. That's said in verse, I forget which verse. But them which heard the word, that's the ones that the Holy Ghost fell on. The Holy Ghost cannot bless people who do not love the truth. When these people heard it, they responded not with a general curiosity about the matter, but with a desire to obey what they learned. It's a big difference between being curious about what you heard and having a true desire, I want to know what God has to say, and I want to live by that. God will meet you there with that kind of hunger. If we just come as observers, we just come as ho-hum, whatever happens, just like we would any place else, we're going to leave with nothing. But if we come with hungry hearts like these people who heard the word, they wanted that word, God responded in turn, I want to be like that, don't you? <clears throat> When these people heard it, they responded not with a general curiosity about the matter, but with a desire to obey what they learned. Peter spoke later at the Council of Jerusalem, later on in Acts 15 is recorded, of how the Gentiles had been purified by faith in Jesus and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He's going to testify of this event later in Acts 15 to the Council at Jerusalem. They heard the word of God, believed it, and were filled with the Spirit. God prepares Peter and Cornelius. God in his wisdom had been at work in both the preacher and his congregation to make this a profitable meeting. Peter's prejudice had been broken down some as he went to pray for the Samaritans to be filled with the Holy Ghost earlier in, in Acts 8. When chapter 10 opens, we find him staying with Simon a tanner. If you, I never even thought about this, so we saw the notes in here. Peter's staying with Simon a tanner. Now, this man's work demanded that Simon would work would work with dead animals all the time and therefore make him permanently unclean in the, according to Jewish law. No Jew who was conscientious of the ceremonial law would have accepted a tanner's hospitality. So Peter had already opened his mind to believe that God would save a tanner and Samaritans. Now God gave a vision showing that uncircumcised Gentiles who did not follow the law could be a part of the church. Cornelius also had a heart prepared to hear from God. We can see signs of the Almighty's dealing in the way that he lived before the preacher came. An angelic appearance had excited him and all of his house. Acts 10 and 33 tells of their anxious anticipation for the service. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God? If a preacher and a congregation come to church with a prepared heart, God is willing to move and will move. Peter's message to the Gentiles that day was the same message it was to the Jews. 
What a perfect time to present a two-road concept. What a great place for Peter to offer another way for the Gentiles to get to heaven. But Peter did not offer another way for this another type of people because there were not and are not two paths or two roads. There is one and only one way to eternal life, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. Amen. Too many today try to take classes of people, groups of people, and tell them that they each have their own way to heaven. But we know this is false in every sense of the word. That's why there are so many religions that teach heaven as an ending, but all do not teach the right way of getting there. There is only one way to heaven again. John 14 and 6, Jesus, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter's message was clear and concise. We read it all at the start. We were reading the very first message. When we were reading that, we are reading the very first message preached to the Gentiles specifically, and the reception of that message was amazing. We've already said it. Verse 44 says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. I would hate to think, and I'm, I know we're, we need to close here, but several things I want to mention. First of all, I want to say we read that, um, you know, our what's it called golden text i read it three times for a reason this story is told three times in the book of acts and anytime god repeats himself i love it when god repeats himself don't you i mean i get it the first time i want to get it the first time but when he says something twice i better pay attention when he says something three times my goodness he's trying to make a point it happens in acts 10 peter testifies of it again in acts 11 he testifies of, of it again in acts uh, 15 he tells the story again to, to those that will listen. God means something when he says something three times. And I'm so thankful that we're the recipients of this. What he's told here affects us today. We're all sitting in a Pentecostal church this morning because of what happened in Acts 10. Amen? I would hate to think that I couldn't have something that God had to offer. Wouldn't you? I would hate to think that. I would hate to think that I would never have access to certain gifts that only he could give, that they were exclusively for others. As if I was on the outside of a display window, pressing my nose up to the glass, staring in and drooling over an amazing pair of shoes that I could never own. Sister Audrey, can, she can um, relate to that, right? Shopping kind of, <laughs> yeah. But I am by no means reducing spiritual gifts to the value of shoes at all. I'm just trying to paint a picture of longing for something that cannot be had. God isn't in the business of dangling carrots on strings hanging on sticks, trying to lead us along. He's very much in the business of giving us what he has for us. He very much wants all of us to claim and possess and be saturated in his gifts of salvation, sanctification, and the Holy Ghost baptism. Amen. This story of the Gentiles now being recipients of the gospel and of the Holy Ghost is shared again three times in God's word. God wants all of us to be a part of his kingdom. Even from the time of the Old Testament, he reached into the Gentile world. We see examples of that throughout his word. He reached into the Gentile world throughout the Old Testament. But now here in the New Testament, he is preaching to them specifically. We would be horribly wrong to ever exclude ourselves because we weren't born in a Pentecostal heritage. How many of you raised in a Pentecostal home? Not everybody, right? I wasn't. We would be wrong to exclude ourselves from a Pentecostal future by saying we didn't have Pentecostal past. That's so wrong. God doesn't exclude anyone. The devil works to separate and divide. God's desire is for everyone to partake in his goodness, his gifts, his grace, and it is up to us to respond, to realize our need for him and all the things he has for us. Thank God for Acts 10. Amen. If that had never happened, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't have the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, if you didn't have the Holy Ghost... I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. I thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for each of you. I hope you got something out of the lesson. Talked a mile a minute. Um, but I love the Lord. And I just want to go to heaven with each and every one of you. I love you. Praise the Lord. Questions fill my mind. Did I make the right choice this time? Am I really where you want me to be? It's so hard for me to know. Very
very quickly. Just which way I need to go. So I guess I'll pray some more and wait to see. And then the Spirit comes along and reminds me. Good morning. Welcome to South Asheboro Church of God. So good to see you in God's house today. Good to have Daniel and Sarah Field with us this morning. Just take your liberty in the Lord. Good to have Sister Angela back. She's been sick. I'm glad she's back today. Praise God. Uh, it's good to have all those here, all the home folks, and those watching online. Just uh, let the Lord have his way today in your life. Uh, let's stand and let's pray for his anointing over the services today. Precious Heavenly Father, we come to you again today. We just thank you and we praise you, Lord God, for this opportunity to come together, Lord God, to worship and glorify your holy name, Lord God. 
we thank you for every blessing, Lord, that you bestowed upon us, Lord God, and all that you're going to do. I thank you for the word of God we heard this morning in the Sunday school, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for and sister Amy and helping her, Lord. Lord, I ask God you help us as a Pentecostal church of God. We will be Pentecostal through and through, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, for the promises of the Jew and for the Gentile, Lord God, for all that you'll call upon, Lord God. Lord, I ask God you just minister, Lord, in a mighty way today. Touch our pastor, Lord, anoint the service, Lord, anoint the preaching, Lord God. Lord, I ask God you anoint the song service, the altar, the altar service, Lord God. Everything's said and done, Lord God. We'll give you the praise for it. We'll give you the honor. We'll give you the glory for it, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Praise your holy name. Praise your wonderful name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for all your bountiful blessings, Lord God. Praise your holy name. Praise your wonderful name, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, just touch, Lord God. You know who was going to be here today. You knew what the need was, Lord God. Lord, I ask God you to pour out your spirit today in a mighty way and touch each and every day, Lord God. Ooh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise your holy name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's continue to worship as the choir comes at this time ministering song.
gospel ship. Hallelujah. I enjoyed the Sunday school lesson this morning. You know, the Pentecost is for all of us. You know, if we are if Jew or Gentile, you know, we, and we are a Pentecostal church through and through. Praise God. Yes. You know, today is Palm Sunday. And in Palm Sunday refers to Jesus' triumphal in Jeru- entry into Jerusalem. John 12 and 13 tells that much people took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. But just a few days later, this same bunch would be crying, crucify him, crucify him. But how much has changed today? How many people today, they'll bless the Lord with their mouth, but they'll crucify them with the way that they live? You know, this is Palm Sunday. You know, if the Lord tarries to the next Sunday, we'll be uh, celebrating Easter when he risen. From, and praise God, we do serve a risen Savior. Praise God. Let's continue to worship and give and get our uh, uh, ushers come and receive our tithe and offering. And today is uh, Widow's uh, Offering Sunday, so after they take the tithe and offering, we'll do the Widow's Offering. Brother Matthew, would you pray over this time of worship? Well, look what the Lord has done. Come on and look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me. It was just in God richly bless you for your faithfulness and giving. Uh, i got a lot to pray about. Let's continue to remember, I uh, pray for Brother and Sister Ball's healing, that God will heal them, get them back on that pu- church pew. I, I see them sitting there. I'm believing God's going to completely heal their bodies. Uh, thank God for what he's done for Sister Sandra and what he's continued to do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Continue to remember uh, Brother Short Ridge that he will have a speedy recovery, that God will just bless that man of God and he'll be able to get back in the pulpit. Continue to pray for uh, Brother Clark and his family. Uh, Brother Clark's daughter went home to be with the Lord. And, you know, he, he's not sad because she's going to be home to be with the Lord, but, you know, we always miss them when they're gone. And he'll be able to see her again. But remember that family. Pray for Lawson, Sister Darling's husband, uh, for healing and for salvation. He's supposed to go Wednesday for some surgery, so pray that God will be with him. Uh, also pray for uh, Brother Patrick Clark's healing, that God will completely heal him. Pray for Haley and for Harper. Uh, pray for Sister Helen Thornburg. She fell and she needs healing in her back. Uh, pray for healing for Fred Stout and for Grace Craven. Uh, continue praying for Sister Garen. She's still uh, weak. Pray that God will touch her and completely heal her body. And we want to pray for Sister Valerie. She's very sick this morning. And I would like it. I just feel impressed how Sister Ann's will come up here and have her anointed for have poor, poor Valerie. Valerie's very, very sick. Uh, she was saying that if she does not any better, she would have to take her to the emergency urgent care, but we're believing that God's going to touch her. Yes, we can. What we want to say, remember that little card we have, pray first. Yes. Okay. Stand, if we'll stand, go to the Lord in prayer.
waiting on her. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I do believe God heals. Amen. He's a healer. How do you know that his word says he's a healer? Right. Amen. Amen. I believe his word. Don't you? Yes. Uh, in the name of Jesus. Continue to worship with Sister Amy, Sister Brady, and Sister Harris come to minister in song. Amen. Amen. While they're getting ready, somebody stand and brag on the Lord. God's done something wonderful for you this week. You want to stand and tell about it, testify. Say praise the Lord. He's a miracle worker. Amen. I'm glad he hears our prayers. Aren't you? Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's worship him this morning. Now, we're glad to see all of you here, but we didn't come to see you. We come to see him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. This is his house. Let's worship yes. him. Praise God.
great God and greatly to be praised. He does miracles. You say, well, I've never seen a miracle. If you've got saved, you have. You've experienced a miracle. You can take a sinful soul. He's, he's dead in sin and cleanse him with his blood and make him alive and for, forevermore. Praise God. This time we'll turn the service to our pastor, Brother Shelton. Give the Lord a good hand and tap off from the praise on this beautiful Sunday morning. <laughs> what a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. I'm glad I'm not somewhere with a hangover this morning. There was a time I was a young man lost in sin and would wake up with a hangover on a Sunday morning or another morning. But I'm glad to be saved today, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody said, well, you know, you don't know how, how bad they are, how long they've been this way, how deep in sin they are. But there's power in the blood, amen, amen, to break chains of sins, to wash and to cleanse and to make people free. I'm glad to be free in him. Let's give all the singers a hand. I enjoyed that. Enjoyed the good choir this morning. Appreciate Well, man, my wife, too. I know you thought that was all my daughters, but one of those was my wife. Amen? For the visitors. I don't get, want to make sure that's clear. Uh, the Sunday school teacher was my bride. Amen? Glad to have our visitors today. Good to have Daniel and Sarah Field with us this morning. And their little daughter, she's a pretty little girl. Amen? Give them a hand for being here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> all of you, all the home folks, glad to see you today. We've got several missing, several out this morning dealing with sickness. We want to pray for them, that God will heal them, and God will help them. I know that he can, don't you? Amen. His word says it, and I believe what his word says. Amen. We want to um, keep our mind on God. Everything we do here in the service is about him. The singing, the teaching, the preaching, the worship, the giving, everything is about Jesus. And we want to make sure that we don't lose sight when we come into his house that he is the focus of everything. The pulpit is in the center of the church because the word is to be the center of the church. Amen? I know, you know, some, some churches have moved their pulpits over to the side and, uh, you know, it's supposed to be right in the center. The pulpit, the word of God, should be the center of the church. Christ is the word of God and he's to be the center of everything in our lives. Amen? I love him with all my heart. Don't you? Thank you again for the wonderful Pastor Appreciation Weekend uh, last Sunday. We had a wonderful time, and I want to say thank you again for all the gifts you blessed us with, the, the wonderful meal, all the good fellowship, and uh, we're just excited about what God's doing here. Matthew chapter 7 this morning. If you have your Bibles, let's stand, please. Let's get in the Word of God. I won't try to hold you past two or three today if we can help it. We'll give you time to get home, have something to eat, and get back tonight. Amen. Matthew chapter 7, we'll begin reading in verse 13, from very familiar uh, scripture this morning, it's a very simple message, the gospel is a very simple message, amen, amen. but yet it's profound, uh, it's the most wonderful story that can be told, uh, the gift of salvation and God sending his son to die on that old rugged cross so that we might be saved, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody in this world knew what we knew? knew who we knew, served who we served. Wouldn't it be wonderful? You, wouldn't, you would never hear about what we heard about in Nashville taking place in that, that school there. You wouldn't have to worry about drugs being handed out in schools anymore. The jail houses would be empty. Police officers would have to find something else to do. Is that right? If everybody in this country knew Jesus and served Jesus, this country would be completely different than what it is right now. You wouldn't have to worry about your children being confused about genders in this day. Is that right? You wouldn't have to worry about those things. You wouldn't have to worry about drunk drivers driving down the road killing people. You wouldn't have to worry about locking your doors at night when you went to bed. You could leave your doors unlocked and your windows up, not worrying about anybody trying to break in and do anything to you if people knew Jesus. Amen. Somebody said, what's the cause of all this going on? They're going to do a lot of you know, investigation, they're going to do a lot of research trying to figure out what caused this young lady who identified as a he or a him 
uh, was confused in her gender. They're going to do a lot of investigating, trying to figure out what caused her to do this, to, what motivated her. Well, I can tell you, friend, there's only one thing that did that, and that's sin. Sin destroys and sin kills, and the devil's behind such madness. Jesus said that the devil comes, the thief comes, but for to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. We need that life of Jesus Christ, don't we? Amen. Matthew chapter 7, begin reading in verse 13. Let's do pray first before we read the Word of God. Father, thank you again. We're glad to be in the house of God. Good to be in your presence today, Lord. Thank you for the Spirit of God that's in our midst, Father. We pray now for the next little while, God, that you'll lay your hand on me. I need your touch as always. I can't do anything without you, Lord. I need that touch from on high that makes preaching easy and effective, Lord. I pray don't let it miss its mark today, God. I pray if there's a lost soul in this congregation, there's a backslider here, that today they would find their way to this altar, Lord, and make right with you. I pray for those watching online today, God, that you would touch their hearts. There's a lost soul that watches this service, God, that they would be pricked in their heart. They'd be convicted of their sins, God, and they would surrender their lives to you and be born again. And Father, I pray that you'll just move and minister in these altars now. We pray again for all those that are sick today, Lord. Touch them in their homes or wherever they may be, God. Uh, they need your divine touch. You're still the great physician. Uh, you're still the balm of Gilead, Lord. Pour in that healing to them now. And Father, we just praise you and give you the glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. All God's people shouted amen. amen. Jesus said here, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate, that is the narrow gate, the small gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. In other words, there's a lot of people on that broad road leading to destruction. That's what Jesus is saying right here. Verse 14, because straight is the gate. And narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. When it talks about being a straight gate and a narrow way, it, it's, it is this because there's only one way. There's not a multitude of ways. So that narrows it down. There's only one way to go to heaven. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. May God add his blessings to his red words. You may be seated for a little while this morning. I want to preach to you for a little while this morning on this thought, the Lord being our help today, simply choosing the right way, choosing the right way. Jesus clearly taught in the word of God that there is only one way for the soul to go to heaven. Jesus said in John 14 and 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Here we find that Jesus narrows it down to only one possible way to go to heaven, and that is through him. Here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14 that we've read to you here this morning, Jesus tells us that there are two ways leading into eternity. One way is the right way, and the other way is the wrong way. One way is the right choice, and one way is the wrong choice. One path is going to lead you to heaven. The Bible said the other way will lead you to hell. In this passage here, Jesus speaks of two gates. He speaks of two ways, two groups of people, uh, and two destinies. One of the gates that Jesus describes here, he tells us uh, that this gate leads to life. He calls it a narrow gate. He said that this gate is small and that this way that leads to life uh, is a narrow way. He also tells us the truth that very few people are going to find this way, uh, but this gate, uh, this straight gate, this narrow gate uh, 
it will lead to eternal life in heaven. Now, you listen to me here this morning. Jesus said this gate would be narrow. This gate would be small. The way would be narrow, uh, but thank God that the way is not shut. He said it's a tight way. It's a small way to get there. But thank God that the door is still open in this day. Jesus Christ has opened up this way uh, by his death there on the cross at Calvary. We know that Jesus is both the gate and the way. His payment for our sins made it possible uh, for God to open the way of salvation uh, for us all. Sister Shelton talked this morning about that, that door being open to the Gentiles. Amen. We are the Gentiles today. I'm glad, my friend, that God has made a way. Amen. I'm not a Jew. I have no Jew heritage, no background as a Jew. Amen. No ties to the Jews. But I'm glad that God made a way for the Gentiles, for us, that were lost in our sins. God made a way through his son, Jesus Christ, that we too can be called the children of God. We can be forgiven of our sins. We can be washed by the blood uh, and when we leave this life uh, we can go to a home in heaven uh, and forever be with the Lord. Somebody give him a hand of praise uh, in this house today. Uh, God enables people to find this gate, this small gate, this narrow way uh, through his grace. It may be a small way it may be narrow, uh, but I'm glad that it's still open right here and right now because the gate is still open, uh, because the door is still open. Uh, that means that there's still hope right now uh, for all of our lost loved ones. Uh, there's still hope for our lost family members. Uh, there's still hope for our lost friends, our lost neighbors, uh, our lost co-workers. Uh, amen. That means there's still hope for all of those uh, who are bound in sin and on their way to hell. As long as God leaves the door open, as long as the gate is open, uh, there is still hope for that lost soul uh, that's bound up in sin. The Bible said in the days of Noah that God left the door open after he called Noah and his family on board that ark. He said, come in here where I'm at. Come in here with me. But for seven more days, God left the door open. I believe that if anybody outside that ark would have had faith enough to walk on board that ark, they would have been saved. It was not till the seventh day that God himself shut the door door uh, and all of those outside that ark they perished uh, in their sins uh, there will come a day when God will shut the door uh, there will come a day when God will shut the gate uh, but right now thank God for the grace of God uh, that the door still open uh, and whosoever will let him come uh, God will still save that lost soul hallelujah to God Hey man, the gate is still open, so there's still hope for lost mankind right here and right now. We realize that this gate and this way is narrow because it focuses on God's truth. Truth must be narrow. That's the nature of truth. When we talk about truth, uh, hey man, either a thing is true or it's not true. When it comes to the things of God, when it comes to the Word of God, there are no gray areas. I've heard people say that, well, you know, that's kind of gray there. When it comes to the Word of God, uh, a thing is either right or it is wrong. Doesn't matter whether you think it's right or wrong or not. Uh, amen. It is the Word of God, and God's Word is truth. Amen. Amen. A thing is true regardless uh, of how somebody feels about it. Our opinion does not determine truth. It does not matter if we believe in the law of gravity or not. Uh, you go up on a high building. Uh, you jump off of that building. Uh, doesn't matter if you believe that gravity is real or not. Uh, you jump off that building, you're going to fall to your death. That is truth. Can you say amen? Makes no difference whether we like the truth or not. 
makes no difference whether we believe the truth of God or not. It does not matter if we agree with the truth of God or not. It is still the truth. God said, let every man be a liar, but let God be true. His word is forever settled in heaven. His word is true. So if you want to build your life on something, if you want to raise your children the right way, if you want to have an assurance of going to heaven uh, when you die, and you will die, uh, you better make sure that you build your life on the truth uh, of God's word. Uh, you better make sure you raise your family by the word of God. Uh, you better make sure that you obey this book uh, because if you obey this word of God, uh, we're going to hear him say a job well done, uh, thou good and faithful servant, uh, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Somebody said, I, I just don't believe everything that's in there. That does not change anything about this book. Somebody said, I don't believe it's God's word. That does not change anything about this book. This word is true. God is true. And if we'll live by the truth, we have the hope and the assurance we're going to make heaven our home. Somebody shout amen. I feel good in my soul here this morning. Truth is narrow. It is that way by nature. It matters not whether the world believes it or not. It's still the truth. The Bible tells us that God's way is a narrow way. It is a small gate. And it's based on the truth of his word. If we're going to go to heaven when we leave this life, we have to choose to go God's way. If you go the way of man, you're going to be in a mess. If you go the way of men today, if you go the way of religion, uh, you're going to be so confused, you're not going to know daylight from darkness uh, and up from down. There's, there's so many different teachings and so many different denominations and so many different beliefs. Uh, somebody said, who's right? You have Baptist denomination. You have Church of God. Uh, you have Methodist. Uh, you have Presbyterian and on and on and on. Uh, somebody said, who's right? Uh, I'll tell you who's right. Uh, those that live by this book right here. Uh, those that live by the Word of God. Uh, you're not going to go to heaven because you're Baptist uh, no more than you'll go to heaven because you're Church of God. Uh, you will go to heaven uh, because you've been born again. Uh, you've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, you live by the word of God, you obey the word of God, uh, and heaven will be your eternal home. The way of God is a narrow way. It is a small gate. To go to heaven, we have to go God's way. We have to go the narrow way through the small gate. We have to go by the truth of God's word, uh, or we cannot go to heaven. I want you to notice here, Jesus said of this straight gate, this narrow way, he said, and few there be that find it. The reason that there are few who find this gate is because there are few who seek this gate. Jesus told us, he said, if we would seek, we would find. Amen. But the truth of it is today, uh, many people are seeking so many other things uh, and other ways uh, that many will not find this way. They will not find the right way. Men today seek their own way. They want to go their own path. They want to live for themselves and please themselves. A majority of this world today, uh, they're not interested in the narrow way that leads to heaven. They don't want any restrictions. They don't want any thou shalt not. They want all the blessings, but they don't want the cross. I said they want all the goodies of heaven. They want the Lord to pay their power bill. They want the Lord to keep them healthy. They want the Lord to keep money in their pocket. They want the Lord to work everything out, all their problems. Amen. But they don't want to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Jesus Christ every single day. But if you're going to live for him, you got to die out to yourself. I said if you're going to live for Jesus, you got to die out to yourself, die out to your will, die out to the old nature and follow Jesus Christ. The reason that many are going to miss this way is because they don't want to go this way. 
They don't want to die out to themselves. They want to live to please their flesh and to feed that sinful flesh and enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The Bible says, because of this, they're not seeking this gate. They're not seeking this narrow way. They're not seeking Jesus Christ. How do you know that, Brother Shelton? Because in most places in this country, in the United States of America, you're forbidden to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Our kids can't pray in school. Come on, say amen to me. You can't use the name of Jesus when you gather for a prayer gathering. Amen. He at the mayor's breakfast. You can't use the name of Jesus because we don't offend the Muslims and the Buddhists and all the others. But let me remind you what the Word of God says. Amen. The Bible said in the book of Acts, there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. If you you want to know Jesus if you'll seek him you'll find him if you want to know the truth you seek truth that truth is the son of a living God and if you seek him you'll find him and if you find him you'll find eternal life in him men are not seeking the narrow way they're not seeking Jesus Christ but he said I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father. Nobody can go to heaven except by him. That's the reason today that most orders across the land are going to be barren. You're not going to find very many sinners in the orders seeking God on this Sunday. From church to church all across this land, when the order calls are given, you're not going to find very many sinners in that order uh, uh, repenting of their sins, making right with God. Uh, amen. The reason is uh, men are not seeking God. They're not seeking Jesus Christ. Uh, they're not seeking this narrow way. I want to remind you what the Bible said. Uh, there's going to come a day uh, when God's grace is going to run out upon mankind. There's going to come a day right now. Uh, we live in the day of God's grace. Uh, but there is a judgment coming upon this world uh, because of its sins against God. God's going to rapture his church uh, out of this old world. Uh, and this world's going to be thrust into tribulation uh, like it's never known before nor will ever know again. I don't want to be here in that day. I, I want to go when the trumpet sounds. I, I want to go when Jesus steps out on the clouds of glory and calls his church, the bride, to come up hither. I, I don't want to be left here to go through that terrible time. I, I want to make sure I'm walking the straight and the narrow road. I, I want to make sure I'm sold out to him. I, I want to make sure I'm numbered among the redeemed. And when he comes, I'm going to tell this world goodbye. Give him a hand of praise today. Hallelujah to God. The reason, he said, there's few that find it. There's few on this narrow way. It's because there's few people seeking this narrow way. You want to offend somebody today? Tell them about Jesus. You want to make somebody mad? Uh, tell them about heaven. Uh, tell them about hell. Hey, man, people will get mad at you. I, you know, they'll cuss at you. They'll, they'll walk off, leave you standing there. But there'll come a day then they'll wish they had known Jesus. There'll come a day they wish they had sought him uh, and knew the truth. Can you say amen? They've made their choice. They're going to spend eternity in hell lost and undone without God. You make no mistake about this this morning. There are few who enter in by this gate according to the words of Christ because there are few that are willing to acknowledge uh, that Jesus Christ is still the only way to heaven. That's why Jesus exhorts us and commands us uh, to enter by the narrow gate. Uh, it's still the right way. It's still the only way. It is still through Jesus and his shed blood. We cannot get to heaven any other way. 
Jerry talked about it this morning in the Sunday school. You can't get there on your good works. You can't be a morally good person to go to heaven. Doesn't matter if you give your life for somebody else. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. Nicodemus was a good man. He was a religious man. He tied. He was faithful to the temple. He knew the law of God. He fasted. But yet Jesus told that morally good man, that religious man, that your religion cannot save you. You've got to come through Jesus. You've got to be washed by the blood. Your sins have got to be washed away. But all of those that will come through him and will come by the blood, uh, he will forgive us of our sins. He is faithful and just uh, to forgive us of our sins uh, and cleanse us uh, of all our unrighteousness. Jesus is still the only way. I know, I know there's other, other teachings and other things out there and people say, well, you know, we're all going the same place. We're just going different ways to get there. That's not true. You have to go through Jesus. Amen. The Muslims cannot go to heaven. Did you feel that kick a little bit? The Muslims cannot go to heaven. The Catholics cannot go to heaven. The Buddhists cannot go to heaven. You say, Brother Shelton, you're being awful narrow-minded. I, I didn't write that book. I'm telling you what the book says. If you worship any other false god, any other god uh, except the true and living God, uh, if you try to get there on your good works uh, or through any other kind of idol or any other false god, uh, amen, call yourself what you will, uh, but you will not make heaven your home. Uh, you have to go through Jesus Christ. Uh, and if you get born again, uh, you're not going to be a Muslim anymore. Uh, you get born again, uh, you're not going to be a Buddhist anymore. Uh, you get born again. Again, uh, you're not going to try to get there through Mother Mary. Uh, you're going to go through Jesus Christ. Somebody give him praise today. That is the truth of God's Word. I'm not trying to make you mad or offend anybody. Amen. But the truth will offend. And the truth makes people mad sometimes. I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. You get Jesus in your heart, and you're not going to worship idols anymore. You get Jesus in your heart, you're not going to worship trees anymore. You're not going to worship things carved out of stone. You get Jesus in your heart, and you're going to worship the true and the living God. Jesus is the only way. Do we still believe that today? Do we still believe there's no other way to go to heaven except through Jesus Christ? Jesus then tells us, he talks of that straight gate, that narrow way, that small opening. Then he tells us the other way is a wide and broad way. And he said this way will lead to our destruction. He said for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. The word translated here for destruction does not mean annihilation. Doesn't mean you're just going to be destroyed completely in the sense, of, amen, that you are no more. That's not what it's talking about here. When it talks about destruction, uh, the word destruction refers to a loss. It refers to total ruin. It refers to utter and complete loss of well-being. The word destruction here refers to the destiny of hell uh, for all of those who follow this path. Those who die and go to hell, it's the fatal way. The broad way is a fatal way. It is a destructive way. It is the way to eternal death. In that awful place called hell, uh, people will be dying for eternity, but yet they will never die. Amen. There is no purgatory as the Catholic Church would have you to believe. I had a man that used to work for me years ago when I worked secular work, and uh, you know, he he come out of a Catholic background, and he told me, he said, where I grew up at, what they told us, that would, when you died, if a family member died, you would pay a priest from the church to come, and if you paid them enough money, uh, that your loved one went to a holding cell, a holding place, purgatory, and if you had enough money to pay that priest, uh, he would pray a prayer and pray your loved one into heaven. 
I said, that's idolatry. That is witchcraft. I said, what happened to the poor people? Those that didn't have the money to pay the priest, he said, then their family members went to hell. I'm telling you, that is not true. That is not the word of God. There is no purgatory. There is no holding place. If you die in your sins, the Bible said when, when that, rich young, that rich man died, he, man, he lift up his eyes in torments. He lift up his eyes in hell. He was not annihilated. He was not immediately destroyed, but he's there to this very day. If you die without Jesus, you'll lift up your eyes in hell, and every day, through eternity you'll be dying over and over again but you'll never be able to die Jesus said there are many that are on this road to destruction the Bible said in Romans 6 and 23 the wages of sin is death when we embark on that broad road we begin down a path that will ultimately lead to our eternal damnation Young or old, you say, Brother Shelkin, I'm a young person. I got my whole life ahead of me. How do you know that? How do you know you have one more day on this earth? The Bible said not one of us are promised another day. Every one of us are just one breath away from eternity. And when we breathe that last breath, how we live is how we'll die. If we didn't prepare to meet God, the moment we breathe that final breath, we'll lift up our eyes in hell. Amen. There is no coming back from that place. There is. Listen, you'll pray and you'll beg and you'll scream and plead for God to have mercy on your soul, to give you grace. Well, you have that mercy right now. You have that grace right now. You better find an order and take advantage of it. Give your life to Jesus. Find the a path and walk that road all the way to heaven. Somebody say amen. None of us are promised another day. This could be my last day on this earth. I better be ready to meet Jesus. This could be your last day on this earth. You better be ready to meet Jesus. People think today we can choose this way, the broad road, and still go to heaven. But the Bible's clear it will eventually lead us to hell. This is a strategy of Satan today, trying to convince us uh, that the eventual destiny of those uh, who enter by that broad way is still heaven. The devil lies to our young people and tells them, you can, you can have fun in sin. You can do all that. Uh, he lies to church people. Uh, hey Amen. You don't have to give all that up, lay all that down. Uh, you can still partake of those sinful things. Uh, you're going to go to heaven when you die. But that's not what the Word of God says. Jesus said those on that broad road uh, is eventually going to lead them to eternal damnation of their soul. The devil's lied to countless people down through the ages. But if we choose that broad road, we're going to choose the destruction of our eternal soul. Jesus describes this way here that leads to destruction as the broad way. That tells us that this way has room enough for everybody. There's plenty of room on that broad way. To travel this broad road requires nothing of that person. You can believe anything or believe nothing. Any lifestyle is acceptable. Any belief system is valid. You can just add Jesus to what you already are, or you don't have to have Jesus at all. That's a lie of the devil that's convinced people today uh, that you don't have to quit sinning. Uh, you don't have to go to church. Uh, you don't have to pray. Uh, you don't have to read your Bible. Uh, you don't have to repent of your sins. Uh, you don't have to be born again. Uh, and you can still go to heaven. Jesus said, uh, if you're going to go to heaven, uh, you got to go God's way. Uh, and that is through his son. Uh, that is being born again. Uh, that is repenting of your sins. Uh, and the word repent means uh, to turn and go the other way. Nobody can come to Jesus, get born again, and continue to practice a sinful lifestyle and think they're going to go to heaven. You have fooled yourself if you believe that. I know people have to grow. I know young converts. I, you, I understand all that. 
I'm telling you, when Jesus comes into your heart, uh, there's going to be such a change in your life. Uh, you're not going to continue to practice sin as a habit uh, day by day. You get born again, the Lord's going to get you out of the sinning business. Say amen to me. The soul that sin shall die. And if we continue to practice sin... You can justify it all you want. You can find a preacher, some jack leg somewhere that'll tell you you can still drink, smoke, cuss, chew, commit adultery, live in perversion, be a homosexual, be a transgender. You can steal. You can lie. You can do all those things. If you prayed a little prayer when you was 12 years old at a youth camp and you said you got saved, doesn't matter how you live after that, you're going to go to heaven. That is not the Word of God. I said that is not the Word of God. Uh, amen. The Bible said when we get born again uh, that old things are passed away uh, and all things become new. Uh, we become new creatures uh, in Christ Jesus. My nature changes now. Before I got saved as a young man, I drank heavily. I drank. I, you know, there wasn't no question about that. I was going to get that beer. But when I got saved on a Sunday night in that old building over there, there's never been another drop of that poison in my mouth. Amen. You want to know why? Because my nature's been changed. I don't have a desire for that anymore. I don't want to live the way that I used to live. I want to live for Jesus Christ because Jesus saved my soul. Somebody give him praise today. Hallelujah to God. Those on that broad way, they say it doesn't matter how you live. Doesn't matter the way you've been born again or not. Doesn't matter if you live a holy and righteous life or not. Everybody's still going to heaven when they die. I heard something here recently. I shared it with Sister Shelton. I heard a lady say of, of Lisa Marie Presley that died. Now, I'm not her judge. I wasn't there when she died. I don't know anything about her soul. She had her heart right with God. She's in a better place. But if she didn't, she's not in a better place. I don't care if it's a celebrity or, or an alcoholic in a gutter somewhere. And that woman said, after Lisa Marie Presley died, she said, I, I'm just thankful now that she's there in heaven with her daddy and with her ex-husband, Michael Jackson, and she's there with her son who committed suicide. I'm just glad they're all there together in heaven. Let me explain something to you about the Word of God. Dale Earnhardt is not in heaven driving laps around heaven in his race car. Nod your pretty heads at me. Michael Jackson's not moonwalking up down streets of gold. Elvis Presley's not in heaven gyrating his hips. If they died without Christ in their heart, I don't care who they were, what they had in this life, the fame that they had. Amen. If they died without Jesus in their heart, uh, if they died without the blood, uh, they are not in heaven today. I wasn't there when they died. Uh, maybe they had time to call on the Lord. Uh, I wasn't there when Elvis overdosed. Uh, amen. Uh, maybe in that last moment he had time to call on God uh, and God had mercy on his soul. Uh, he did for the thief on the cross. He got in uh, at the last moment. Uh, but the world would have you to believe. Uh, Hollywood would have you to believe uh, that you can live for the devil, live like the devil, serve the devil, uh, and then when you die, everybody's going to heaven and we're all going to have a happy time over yonder. Jesus said that the broad road, the sinful road, those outside of Christ, they're heading for destruction and their soul will end up eternally in a devil's hell. I'm not preaching mad. I'm just telling you the truth. Everybody goes to heaven. Doesn't matter how they live. Doesn't matter if they sang the devil's music. When they got when they died, they went to heaven. Doesn't matter if they were a drug addict or a homosexual or a alcoholic. Doesn't matter the an adulterer. All those things. Doesn't matter what they done. Everybody's in a better place when they leave here. Don't that break your heart to think that? Don't that break your heart to think that the devil's got people so deceived? 
that you can just partake of anything in this old world, live in the sin, and, and just get as deep in it as you want to. But when you die, everybody's going. Let me tell you something. If that were true, uh, God would not have had to send his son to suffer like he did. If that were the case, if everybody could go to heaven, uh, God would have never sent his son uh, to pay the price for our sins. Uh, amen. If everybody went to heaven, uh, amen, of this world, uh, heaven would be no different than this old world. Uh, if you're going to go there, uh, you still got to go by the way of God. Uh, you still got to go by his son, Jesus Christ. Somebody shout amen. I got to close here. I got a whole lot more. This way is found by many. This is the crowded way. It is the way of the majority today. Did you realize there's more people on this earth right now going to hell than there are going to heaven? That's what the Word of God says. That the broad road that leads to destruction, many are going to be on that path. And few are going to find that narrow way because they're not seeking. They're not seeking that narrow way. The Bible tells us that the way of the majority has the appearance maybe of being right, but the majority is not the right way. Because so many people have chosen this way, we say, well, they can't be wrong. I've had people tell me as a pastor, well, what you preach against, those at that other church are doing it, they're going to heaven. Not if it's contrary to the Word of God, they're not. Not if it's contrary to the book, they're not going to heaven that way. We assume because others are doing it and the majority of people are doing it, that it must be okay. So then we throw our lot in with them. We take comfort in numbers. We say, you know, it, it bugs me to no end and it aggravates me to no end to watch a church. You know, that, that's a conservative church. Begin to watch other churches, uh, you know, that begin to pick up the world and become worldly and do all those things. Uh, and because a lot of them are doing it, uh, amen, they think it's all right. Uh, you better hold your ground. Uh, I said you better hold the right banner up high. Uh, you better keep on living holy and separated from this old sinful world. Uh, you better keep living for Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't care if every church in this world uh, goes the other direction. Uh, we better stay the course. Uh, I said we better stay by the Word of God. Amen. God is not in the majority. Amen. God works in the minority many times. What the majority does is usually the wrong thing. But people say because so many people are doing that, maybe it's all right. Don't follow the crowds, friend. You better follow the Word of God. It's the road map. Come on, sister. It's the road map that will get us to heaven. God has always been the God of the minority. Noah preached that old world for over 100 years. But yet, when the floods came, only eight people were on board that ark. I found out in studies there were 200 to 300 million people believed to be alive in that day, in that antediluvian age. Yet only eight souls. God's not a God of the majority. If you go God's way, the, the way of the word, you're going to be in the minority in this world today. You're not going to be popular in this world. You're not going to be received by everybody. You're not going to be liked by everybody. I'm not trying to please me, and I'm trying to please him who gave his life for me and saved my eternal soul. Lot was a righteous man, the Bible said. You say, Brother Shelton, he was living in Sodom. But James said that righteous man Lot, the Bible called him a righteous man. He had his family in the wrong place, and they were influenced by his decision to put them in that place. But the Bible said there when, as he lived in the cities of the plain, when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, only three people were saved. I know Lot's wife came out, but she looked back and she was turned into a pillar of salt. Over 600,000 men, not counting women and children, passed through the Red Sea from that exodus out of Egypt land, but only two of that entire generation entered the promised land. When God used Gideon to fight the Midianites, uh, Gideon had 32,000 men, but God said you got too many. And he whittled it down to only 300 men. God is a God of the minority. We should not be deceived by the decision of the majority. The broad way may be the crowded way, but that does not make it the right way. That does not make it the true way. 
If we go God's way, we're going to be the minority in this world. But I want to go the right way, don't you? I want to go through Jesus. I want to go through the blood because I know that's how I'm going to get to heaven. Everybody stand, please. Hold on one second. I want to, I want to read this article, please. I found this article that was written many years ago by a person to a daily newspaper there in Melbourne, Australia. This is what the writer said. After hearing Dr. Billy Graham on the air, viewing him on television and reading reports and letters concerning him and his mission, I am heartily sick of the type of religion that insists my soul and everyone else needs saving, whatever that means. I have never felt that I was lost, nor do I feel that I daily wallow in the mire of sin, although repetitive preaching insists that I do. The writer said, Give me a practical religion that teaches gentleness and kindness, that acknowledges no barriers of color or creed, that remembers aged and teaches children of goodness and not sin. The writer said, If in order to save my soul, I must accept such a philosophy. You remember Billy Graham, the message of Billy Graham was that of salvation. That was the primary message he preached, salvation, salvation. Not of works, not of our works, but the gift of God. And they said, if in order to save my soul, I must accept such a philosophy, philosophy as I have recently heard preached, I prefer to remain forever damned. And to that I say, and you will. And you will remain forever damned if you refuse to accept the gospel message that you must be born again. You must choose life, and that life is found in Jesus Christ. Some folks will never accept there's only one way to heaven, and they'll die in their sins that way. There are some good people who's going to lift up their eyes in hell simply because they refuse to go through Jesus Christ. Good moral people, good grandmas and grandpas, good moms and dads, children that were good people morally made a difference while they were here in this life, made a difference in their community, their schools, on their jobs, good neighbors, but they refused to accept Jesus and choose life in Him. Some people never accept Him because they don't want to be born again. They don't want to be saved from their sin. They want to live for themselves and not Jesus. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 21 and 8, And under this people thou shalt say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I have set before you the way of life and the way of death. We must choose life. We must choose life. Because if we reject life, then we are choosing death, eternal death in hell. You won't go to hell because you smoked or you drank or you beat your wife or you beat your husband. Today they do that too, you know. You won't go to hell because you committed adultery. You won't go to hell because you shot drugs into your arm or because you abused others. Because there's people that don't do those things that went to hell. But you will go to hell if you reject Jesus Christ. That's, that's what qualifies every person to die lost and go to hell. There are people who never, who never drank their whole lives were good to their spouses, worked hard and took care of their families. But when they died, they lift up their eyes in hell because they rejected God's gift. To go to heaven, you must receive him. To go to hell, you'll have to reject him. And every person, every person living on this earth will have an opportunity sometime in their life to either receive him or reject him. Every person will have an opportunity when the Spirit of God will deal with that heart Convict that soul and give you an opportunity at that moment to choose Jesus. He said today is the day of salvation. Everybody has one of those days in their life where God's going to come to you and deal with you personally to offer you this gift of salvation. And at that moment, what you do with Christ, whether you receive him or reject him, will determine your eternal soul. Some people get many chances. Some people get one chance and that's it. God's ways are not our ways, but what I do know is this.
when God deals with your heart, you better come to him then. And don't put him off to another day till you're older, till you work some things out. You better receive him then. Repent of your sins. Confess your sins. Accept Jesus into your heart and life and serve him because you may not ever have another day of grace in your life. Anybody here by a raised hand? Go ahead and play softly, please. Anybody, anybody by a raised hand say it's a whole lot better life serving Jesus? I won't ever, ever head bowed and every eye closed, please. If you're watching online, you can do the same thing, please. I preached a very simple message today. Choice between life and death, heaven and hell. You would think there would be no question about what choice people would make. I can serve Jesus and go to heaven. I can reject him, live in my sins and die and go to hell. Seems like it would be the easiest decision of all to make, doesn't it? People give more thought to what they're going to put on in the morning to go before they go out today than they do their eternal soul. It's going to live forever. I don't know your hearts here this morning. I'm not your judge. I'm not up here to condemn you. The Bible says if you don't believe Jesus came and died for our sins and you reject that, you're condemned already. But I do want to give you an opportunity in this house if you're watching online. You don't know Jesus. You're not serving Him. You've not been born again. You're living your life in sin. This message is going to follow you into eternity. If you're here today and you've heard this message preached, not because I preached it, but because it's the Word of God. If you die lost, you'll remember this message through eternity. In that awful place, you'll remember the altar call, the altar invitation for you to come and be saved. If you're here and you're lost and you don't know Jesus and you want to be saved today, these altars are open for you to come. Would you come right now? Just come and find you a place to kneel in these altars and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart and life and to save you, and then commit yourself to Him. I'm going to serve you from this day forward. Saints, would you pray this morning, please? Young or old, this altar calls for you today if you're lost. Would you come and be saved? Would you come and meet this man, Jesus? It's a hard life in sin. The way of a transgressor is the hard way. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He gives us joy unspeakable and full of glory. Happiness is an emotion. Joy is not. Joy affects our emotions, but joy is a fruit of the Spirit. You can be sad and still have joy. You can stand over a, the grave of a loved one and cry tears, but still have the joy of the Lord in your heart. Would you come this morning? Would you come if you don't know Jesus? My prayer is over this service already. I pray, Lord, if there's a soul going to be in that service today that's lost, let them come to the altar and get right with you. My prayer is that everybody in this house is ready for heaven. If we were to all die right now, that you're ready, that you have the assurance that you're ready to meet Jesus. Would you come? Would you come? I remember the day I got saved, the Sunday I got saved, I was a young man. And that Sunday morning, my grandpa was preaching, and he gave the order call, and I knew I was lost. I knew I was going to hell. The devil's in my mind telling me every reason why I couldn't live for God, told me all the things you got to give up. You can't serve the Lord. You can't lay all this down. You gotta, you're going to have to quit doing this and that and 
And I left that service that morning without going that order. I knew God was calling for me. I knew he was. I knew the message was for me that morning. I went home that day after church, and I was so discouraged. I told the Lord, I said, Lord, if you will not let me die, and let me get back to that service tonight. Please don't let me die in a car wreck going there. Don't let me die before that service. If you'll let me get back in that service, I'll go to that altar and give my life to you. And I did. That is the greatest choice that I ever made in my life. Was coming to Jesus and giving my life to Him. All those things the devil told me, you got to give up, you got to quit doing if you serve Jesus. You know what I found out? When I met Jesus, I didn't want to do those things anymore. I did not want to do those things anymore. He changed my life. He changed my nature. My desires, my appetites were changed at that moment. And our lives have never been the same, have they, Sister Shelton? Oh, the joy of salvation. If you're here this morning, you've got loved ones, family members that's lost. I want you to come and find a place in these hours. Let's pray for them today. I'm glad the door's still open. We're on board the ark. We're safe. As long as we abide on, the, on board that ark, we're safe. But the door's still open for the lost to come. How do you know that, Brother Shelton? Because the Bible said God is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus didn't die just to save a select few. He died for all lost mankind. Nobody has to die and go to hell. Everybody could be saved if men would just come to Him, surrender their lives, their will to Him. Father, we pray this morning. I know that every one of us in this congregation under the sound of my voice, I know that every one of us have lost family members that desperately need salvation. We all know somebody, somebody somewhere today that needs to be saved before it's too late. So God, this morning we come before you and we pray over those lost souls. We pray for those family members. We pray for those in this community surrounding this church that are lost and on that broad road leading to their destruction. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. We pray a hedge of thorns around them, God, that every way they turn, they would be pricked and uncomfortable until they turn to you. I pray, God, you would convict them with such a heavy conviction that you'd take sleep from them Take their, their natural appetite from them, God. Make their bed hard at night, Lord. Let them turn to you and give their lives to you. Don't let them die lost, God. We pray daily, Lord, for every lost soul on this earth, those that we know and those that we don't, wrath, remember mercy, God. Save their souls, Jesus. Don't let them die lost. Don't let them die without you. We plead for their souls, God. Just like somebody pled for mine, just like somebody prayed for me when I was lost. Just like somebody prayed for you. We pray for them, God. Deal with them where they are. I pray for that alcoholic that's bound by that poison. Lord, that you set them free from it. That drug addict that's, that's so bound up in drugs they steal from their own mother. That you'd set them free, Jesus. I pray for that boy or girl that's, that's got caught up in this wave of perversion today, confusion. 
devil's trying to confuse them whether they're a boy or girl anymore, whether they're a man or woman anymore. I pray you'd set them free, Jesus. Free their mind. Set their heart free. I pray for that family that's in shambles, God, that's breaking because of sin. I pray you'd save the mom and the daddy and all the children, God. I pray for those today that are out there in that fast lane, plunging headlong into hell, God, without any, any concern for their soul. They're not praying for themselves, but we're praying for them, Lord. I pray for that one sitting on a church pew this morning, God, this religious that's learned how to do all the religious things, but they've never been saved. They're lost. I pray you'd open their eyes that are blind, God, and shine a light upon them. Save their soul. I pray for those in prisons and hospitals and rest homes today, God, that are lost and undone without you. Lord, you can walk into prisons and you can walk into hospital rooms. You can walk the halls of the rest homes, God, seeking to find the lost. I pray for our family, our personal family, my aunts, uncles, cousins. I have so many in my family that's lost without you, God. They're on a path to destruction. Some of them seem they don't care. I pray you'd stop them in their tracks, God, and shake them. Wake them up, Lord. Stir them. Let them see their need for a Savior. Their need to be born again. Their need to be forgiven of all their sins. 